Welcome everyone for today's word, meditation on the word. Um, today my text is from Romans 9, 1 to 4, 3. And I would like to read, um, I'll read 1 to 4 actually, but we will be concentrating 1 to 3. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed for cry, from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Today we are um, going to speak about a lost passion. The church has lost something very great. Um, in the world over time. There's one thing which characterized the church in the early days was passion for souls, passion to lead others to Christ. The church history is a fascinating reading. You have to take time to read the history of the church. You will read of great exploits of men and women of God with a passion to reach souls. It started to peak in the time of Martin Luther and lasted till the late last century. Now when you compare the passion to win souls among the general Christian population, it is very, very, it feels like the passion has gone, has lo been lost. We have, him we have become insensitized to the humanity who is trending towards hell. Our own relatives, our own friends, are moving towards hell, but we have no passion to reach out. We have no passion in prayer. We have no passion in words. We have no passion in action to reach them out. And we complain, oh, our, pay, our relatives are not saved. Our friends are not saved. Matthew 9, 36 to 38, Lord Jesus, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they were fainted and they were scattered abo abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest is truly, truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore that the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into the harvest. Today's message is to call you, call myself, to reignite our passion, passion for souls. Someone has rightly said, preach it to your heart. You are likely to hit few others because of that. So don't think that I am only preaching to you. Today's message, I am also convicted. It is about as much as about me, as much as about you. What characterizes us today as individuals? Are we full of passion for the lost or we have lost the passion? That is today's title, Passion for the Lost or Lost Passion. Today we can talk more about COVID, more about this sickness than about Lord Jesus Christ. Any stranger we meet, we don't hesitate to talk about COVID. Oh, how are you managing in the COVID? How is the disease? We talk about everything. We don't talk about Jesus Christ. We can talk more about our work. We can talk more about our business with passion than with the passion of Lord Jesus Christ. An average person can come and talk to us all day and go away without knowing Christ. Isn't it shameful, my dear brothers and sisters? It is shameful about me. It is shameful about you. We were sent into the world to demonstrate to the world who Christ is. And we were supposed to go into the world and tell them about Christ. But what has happened? The world has come into us and we only are focused on the world today. How we live, what we do and what we think instead of talking about Lord Jesus Christ. And the world has displaced Christ. In our test, text, what we read today, Romans 9, 1 to 3, Paul is full of, uh, you know, agony and his passion and his desperation for winning the uh, Jews is evident. He had an all-consuming passion for the lost, especially um, of his, you know, uh, of these immediate Jewish brothers and sisters. Today, one word describes the Christian world, apathy. We don't care. 
we don't care how others live if i am fine if god has blessed me if i've god has made me rich everything is fine in the world one author has said about today's society it is not only in the christian world it is outside too this civilization civilization will die because no one wanted to be bothered so true one historian has said he studied many civilizations in history and he said 19 out of 21 civilizations that is people who lived very rich very well organized societies died from within no one needed to come and conquer because ultimately success killed it the society got so successful the civilization got so successful that it died now that is the world we have been talking about my question to this morning to the question today to this church is this is carelessness the problem in the church is the church dying because we don't want to be bothered there is apathy in the world there is apathy in the church and that apathy of the world has come into the church we we have a very negligent attitude towards the things of god as christians we have become very self serving that the church at large though the numbers are growing is actually dwindling there was there are more than 500 million evangelicals we cannot win 500 million souls but you see in the early church there were 12 apostles and some other 500 people together they shook the earth now paul is a great example of this passion because before he was saved he was persecuting the church actively after he was saved he was preaching and building the church actively i find this lack in myself also when reaching to others with the gospel the west we can show is a little passion when we hear some preachers talk about passion but i but what happens after the preacher goes after a few days passion slows down oh prayer after a few days prayer stops oh preaching out going hospital visits after a few days it stops go here uh, for um, outreach after a few days it stops that's what our passion is about do we have passion for the lost or have we lost passion william booth the founder of salvation army once he said i would like to finish the training of my soldiers by suspending them over hell for 24 hours so they can see with their own eyes what's happening in hell my dear brothers and sisters that's a vision which you cannot shake off we are so casual about the faith of our immediate parents of our immediate relatives of our immediate friends we are so casual about them we don't shed a tear for their salvation maybe many of you do but more, many of you don't paul was a man driven with passion driven to win lost souls you do not need to hear him preach you can feel the passion when you read the letters you will find in this verses of what he has written in the books of the new testament the very essence of the passion for christ people said in second corinthians 10:10 10, it says for his letters they say are weighty and powerful his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible you know they said oh paul when you look at him he looks ordinary guy what what does he think of himself he cannot even speak properly they look down upon his speech but what he lacked in speech and bodily presence he made up in his passion he said in galatians 4:19 my little children of whom i travail in birth again until christ be formed in you no woman has been known to give birth without pain there is pain in childbirth paul says winning souls is almost like that that pain should be in our spirit he saying it is that passion for christ has to be like that the when you go to christ with a request the passion for for him he has to see the passion in you that is what paul was showing to christ that's why he won so many souls fp meyer has said the apostle had got so near to the very heart of his lord that could, he could hear it beat it could he could defy it he could feel the heat 
he could say and it seemed the tender mercies of Christ towards Philippians was beating in his own heart. He was so close to the Lord that he got the Savior's passion for the lost. Not to the extent what Christ had, but it came down in a small form in Paul. Remember, when Christ looked over Jerusalem, what did he say? Luke 13, 34. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them, which are sent unto thee, how often I would have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, yet you would, and you would not. He wept over a rebellious and the people who contradicted him. Here we have Paul doing the same things in Romans 9, 1 to 3. It's as, as if the heart of Christ came into Paul. And uh, I mean, he was so close to Lord Jesus Christ that what affected Lord Jesus affected him. You see, that is what we lack, my dear brothers and sisters. Nearness to Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when we are near to the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be transformed. So you may be sitting and thinking, how do I get this passion for souls? You know, maybe you are one of the people who don't have the passion for the lost. Maybe you have lost the passion you once had. And you are wondering, how do I get it back? Well, let me ask you this question. Let me ask you another question to answer that question. How do you know somebody's heart? Take a husband and wife. You can get to know somebody by spending time by communicating, by being intimate. That's exactly how you know the love of Christ and it has to rub off on you. The closeness to Christ, this lost passion, passion will rub off on you. It is to spend time with the Lord Jesus in his word and before him in prayer. Now, you know, many, many husband and wives who are hearing me know about this. You know, sometimes you can know what your partner is thinking. You can even complete their sentences. Because you have stayed with them so long. You communicating to each other so long. So you know exactly how, you, how your wife thinks. Or exactly how your husband thinks. Because of the intimacy. That is what Christ wants. That he wants to have fellowship with us. That is the secret to evangelism. Not running like a headless chicken around the place. Yes, we need to wear ourselves out in, in service of the Lord. But more important than that is to get closer to the heart of Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the verse 1, what Paul says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. What is he saying here? He wants to stress on the fact that his love for the lost, this passion is not Something just to show somebody it is what is built inside. And the witness is Lord Holy Ghost. He wants us to know what is genuine, genuine love. These tears that he is shedding are tears coming out of that love. Out of that deep agony that these people are not saved. These people are not listening to the gospel. And there is deep agony to cry about it. How long? How long have you been crying? for your mother and father? How long have you been crying for your brother and sister? How long have you been crying for your, uh, for your friends, my dear brothers and sisters? Where there are no tears, there is no victory. Two of the Salvation Army soldiers of William Booth went into one African country and this one year they served, they could not even bring one person to Christ. So they sent a telegram to William Booth and said, uh, William Booth, we are unable to make any headway. He sent only two words, telegram back. He said, try tears. And they had a revival, my dear brothers and sisters. You want to know how you can get everyone to come to Christ in your family, in your friends, in your brothers and sisters? Try tears. Try tears. Love brings desperation. Love brings the, brings the agony, my dear brothers and sisters. Rachel was not, did not have children. Leah was having children. In Genesis 30, 30th chapter, first verse, what did she say? And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. 
you have to put yourself in front my dear brothers and sisters you cannot be comfortable and think that everything is okay with you before you should say lord even you can take away my life but i want my uh, father to be saved i want my mother to be saved i want my brother to be saved i want my sister to be saved i want my friend to be saved i want my neighbor to be saved this is the desperation in paul my dear brothers and sisters love brings desperation there have been stories all over in our towns in our villages in any place you come from in india you will find somebody runs away with somebody some boy runs away with a girl because of love love makes us rebel against our parents love makes us go against the society my dear brothers and sisters but somehow our love only keeps us self satisfied it is a sad thing with the christians that's why paul says i speak the truth it is the truth in christ you see he says he, he says my conscience bears me witness his conscience was trained by the word of god polished by the holy spirit he's telling the truth he's saying i'm not lying the lord holy spirit is my witness he has this all consuming passion for souls he is he is using this thing to show the ply the condition of the people his desire is that they should be saved they should be saved he is suffering physical pain about it he is shedding tears he is shedding tears we can't even shed tears but paul is here suffering pain because they are not saved how long can we carry on like this my dear brothers and sisters christ the lord holy spirit and paul are involved in this passion you cannot do it without christ and the holy spirit he says i tell you of a truth in christ the holy ghost wearing witness if you ever get your passion for for the lost it will be because of your closeness to christ and the and the building ability of the holy spirit your conscience being transformed conscience is a very neutral thing you can train it whichever way you want the the terrorists train the little ones their conscience they kill somebody and they don't feel anything their conscience doesn't hurt them conscience is something how you train it that is why the bible says train up a child in the way when it is growing up so when they grow up the conscience will start to poke now in in verse 1 here's what i want to you to uh, understand he has he stresses his love for his people can somebody look at you and your prayer and know that how much you love the other person you are praying for you see the jews hated him they hated him because he was once their star he was bringing the christians to prison he was punishing everybody who is not in the in the jewish religion but suddenly he met christ on the on the way to damascus and he changed they considered him a traitor they hated him they don't even want to be on the same street where paul was but he said even though you hate me i love you and i'm passionate for you the second reason is he wants to uh, show the genuineness of his passion though he was though they thought he was anti jewish and he was going to the gentiles to give the gospel to allow to bring the law to the gentiles to open the law to the gentiles so that the grace of christ can come they thought he's a traitor they want they are called him so many names but he still love them and now look at verse 2 what he's saying i have this great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart it could be uh, paraphrased like this it is a never ending pain in my heart do we have this pain my dear brothers and sisters regarding our own brothers our own relatives our own siblings our own friends our own neighbors do we have this pain does our heart pain any more my dear brothers and sisters are we involved in the winning the lost if we don't have pain there is no gain my dear brothers and sisters he says it is a continual pain it's an unceasing pain he may be preaching he may be doing anything but he says the pain is continual that they are not saved that they are not saved lord why are they not saved that is the that is the that is the passion um, we we should be care, we should remember this is what he's talking about he's using to describe his pain at the lack of salvation in this people 
you know, I can't even shed a tear, but this man, continuously, Paul, is having pain. The prophets suffered the same thing. You know what Jeremiah said, 419, Jeremiah 419, he said, My bowels, my bowels, I am pained at my very heart. My heart maketh a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace. Because thou hast heard, O my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Jeremiah was talking at the backsliding of Israel, at how they, gave, they had given up Christ and they were following Baal and he's saying that my, there is pain in my stomach, there is pain in my heart, I don't know what to do. Then he says in Jeremiah 14, 17, he says, Therefore thou shalt say this word, uh, this word unto them, Let mine eyes run down with tears night and day, let them not cease, for the virgin daughter of my people is broken with a great breach and with a grievous blow. Can we ever stop crying for our own people, my dear brothers and sisters? If we don't cry for our own people, what will you cry for the people on the row in the world, on the street, on the person you see next, next door, what will you cry? Physical pain has to show in the spirit. It ha You have to, because Paul showed it, Jeremiah showed it, Isaiah showed it, and Lord Jesus Christ, most of all, showed it. Agony of the, uh, after the condition of the people around us, who have our own people who don't know Christ. Our own Christians, brothers and sisters, who are not passionate. So, what to do? I have, you know, sometimes I, I, I may come across as being harsh, but my dear brothers and sisters, you cannot tell the truth without being harsh. I think 95% of the time, we act like Christians. We really don't know what it is to be a Christian. You know, Psalm 126, 5 and 6, listen to this truth, my dear brothers and sisters. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Do you know why we don't have fruit, my dear brothers and sisters? Do you know why our fruit is not lasting? Because we are not sowing in tears. Because we are not weeping. We are not bearing the freshest fruit by weeping. We don't talk to other Christians. We don't, how will we, we don't love Christians. How will we love non-Christians, my dear brothers and sisters? One man said, the, the valves of our heart, when the stress is too much and when pressure is laid, they, they burst and that's when tears come. That is the tears Christ is looking for. Tears win victories. One man said, one man of God said, a cold, unfeeling, dry-eyed religion cannot win souls of men. Tears win victories, my dear brothers and sisters. Tears win victories. A cold, unfeeling, dry-eyed religion has no influence over the souls of men. Why are people not getting saved? Tearlessness is one of the reasons all great men of God, who ever did great work for God, they had broken spirits and wet eyes, my dear brothers and sisters. Jeremiah, we, we heard, is known as a weeping prophet. He wept fountains of tears, rivers of tears. Paul many times has mentioned in the scriptures, he's saying he served the Lord with all humility and many tears. Our greatest example is Lord Jesus Christ, the man of sorrows. I think our Lord's eyes or life was saturated with tears. Here, Paul's heart is broken into pieces. He did not believe that once you die, that is the end of you. you he knew that if you die without Christ, you are thrown in the lake of fire. I'll tell you, my dear brothers and sisters, it is better to be weep now and win your win souls than to weep in heaven when they are thrown into hell. You cannot, you and me cannot see the sight, my dear brothers and sisters, to see your own people fall into. It is better to weep now. It is better to weep now. If someone to ask us, born again believers, do we really believe in hell? Do we really believe in hell? What would we answer? Maybe we'll say yes, but our actions don't show it, my dear brothers and sisters. Our actions don't support our, uh, bel our belief. You know, if we really believed in hell, I'll tell you something. If you and me really believed in hell, we won't keep quiet for one minute till our people are coming into Christ because you don't want to see anyone in that place in hell. 
you don't want to see anyone. There is no sorrow, there are no tears. That's why we come up empty handed. We come up empty handed. Like Paul, our hearts are not pained, no grief in our hearts. Don't be deceived. Everyone who doesn't know Christ will end up in hell. And my dear brothers and sisters, that day, before they step into hell, they will turn around and look at you and me and say, could you not have tried once more to tell me the gospel? Could you not have tried once more? It will be weeping and gnashing of tears, believe me. It's, a, it's a, something to think about in this life. You know, for Paul, this agony was not enough. He even said, now we go to verse 3, he said, I could wish myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Are we desperate enough to tell God this? You know, this parable of the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man was very late. He said, he told Abraham, I have five brothers. Can you send somebody and let them go and tell, the, um, tell them about this hell? Abraham said, they have the word. If they don't believe the word, they will not believe even if somebody comes alive. Please do not un misunderstand me, my dear brothers and sisters. Maybe many of you are crying with shedding tears. Maybe you have the pain. I am talking to people who don't have it. So if you have it, well, fantastic. Continue, develop in that. But if you don't have it, I'm speaking to you. You see, it doesn't affect you anymore. You, you, now it won't affect, but on, in heaven, when you see the judgment day, they're cast into hell. It will be a it will be a lot of tears. What is costing us to win the lost? Is it costing us time? Is it costing any money, inconvenience? Is it costing the food on the table? Sweat of our bro? You see Paul what he said, I could wish. He, he doesn't say, I wish. He said, I could wish. Because he knew it was impossible for him to be cursed. Because Lord Jesus took our curses. You cannot be cursed, my dear brothers and sisters. But he said, I wish I could say I am cursed on behalf of them. Can we say that, Lord, you have given me salvation, but my brother is not saved, Lord. Can you blot me out so that he can be saved? Do we have that desperation, my dear? I'm getting at that, my dear brothers and sisters. This is what Paul is talking about here in Romans 9, 1 to 3. That he, he wished he could be cursed for that brother's sake. Cursed for my child's sake. Cursed for my parents' sake. Cursed for, Lord, the desperation that God will do something. God will do something that they will come to Christ. Oh, we pray. Oh, Lord, please save my father. Please save my mother. Please save my brother. Please save it and forget about it. Go our way. No pain, no apathy, no passion. Such prayers will not go above the roof, my dear brothers and sisters. This is, Paul is showing here what is needed. This is what we, we have to have the emotion, the pain, the agony of childbirth to bring a soul into the kingdom. He says, I, I wish I could have said I am cursed. The word accursed, he uses the same thing in Galatians 1.8 uh, about somebody who preached a different gospel, he said, let them be accursed. Anathema, that's the word, anathema. He says it means to bear the curse of sin. Luther was a, uh, Luther thought it is so incredible of Paul, so incredible of Paul, that he could think himself to be damned for the uh, damned, for the person who has no Christ. Moses said the same thing. Moses came down the hill. He saw the people had made a calf and he told them in Exodus 32, 20, you have sinned a great sin. Now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I will make an atonement for your sin. But in Exodus 32, 32, when he was in front of God, what did he say? Yet now if thou will forgive their sin, if you don't forgive their sin, take me away, blot me out, I pray thee, out of thy book which is written. That is love, my dear brothers and sisters. That is love. It one word summarizes the spirit of Moses, the spirit of Paul. We, it is the spirit of Christ. It is the spirit of Christ. It is the substitution. God, Christ said, you, if it is possible, let this cup pass, but not as I will, but as thou wilt. I am willing, I will, 
I am willing to be the substitution. Colossians 1.24, Paul says, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh, for his body's sake, which is the church. Now, what does it mean, fill up that which is behind, or that which is lacking in the suffering of Christ? There is nothing lacking in the sufferings of Christ, but what is he saying here? Christ's works was finished. There is nothing incomplete about redemption. That's not what he means. It is saying that what is left in the suffering of Christ is, we have to live a life which will show Christ. It will fulfill that which is behind. Sacrificial love. That because for your friends, my friends, for your relatives, my relatives who are unsaved, we may be the only gospel that they will see. They may hear many preachers, but they can see your life. What is your life telling them? What is your life telling them? What is costing them the salvation? What is in your life that is not persuading them to come to Christ? Paul had a continual ache in his heart and that it wouldn't cease. In Paul, in uh, six, Galatians 6.17, he says, I bear in my body the marks of Lord Jesus. Isaiah once said, as soon as Zion travailed, that is, Zion had birth pangs, she brought forth her children. You see, the word martyr in the Bible comes from the word witness. Our witness has to involve our blood. Our true love is very costly. You see, love is the outgoing of the uh, self-sacrificing nature of Christ. Moses and Paul reflected Christ. There is no way people could meet Paul and not know about Christ. Richard Wormrand suffered in the Soviet prison for many people. But you know what they described him? When they met him, he, they said, he is a, he's an avalanche or a storm of love. Because everyone who met him experienced the love of Christ. I'm, I'm not giving Paul the glory, Moses the glory, Richard Wormrand the glory. Because Christ only through the Holy Spirit can make that happen in our lives. Because in 2 Corinthians 5.14, Paul said, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, if one died for all, then we're all dead. You know, I would like to be like Paul. I would like to say, Lord, take my life, but save my brothers, save my parents, save my friends, save my neighbors. You know, how much... You know, the love of Paul was not fake. There was no falseness. It was not forced emotion. It came from the heart. It, there was a constant pain in his heart. It was, that, it was the compassion that passed the test of God. It's, he said, Lord Holy Spirit is the witness. He, can the Lord Holy Spirit be witness to your passion of loving the lost, of my passion to love the lost? You know, we may a few days we will have the passion then we will lose it few days we are thinking about the lost then we lose it few days we think about praying after that it is lost oh christians complain a lot they drone a lot they do a lot of things you know but what is it about some discomfort oh this person didn't talk to me oh that person didn't talk to me oh that per that person didn't talk proper thing that is no time for that my dear brothers and sisters thousands and thousands are being lost including our own people you know david brennard was one of the greatest missionaries his life he only lived he died at the age of 29 his life um, you know motivated thousands of young people to go into missions he wrote like this once when he was on the river bed, he said, I care not where I live or what hardships I go through so that I can but gain souls to Christ. When I am asleep, I dream of these things. When I wake up, that is the first thing on my mind is this great work of winning souls. All my desire is the conversion of sinners and all my hope is in God. That is what it should be. 
Whitfield was one of the greatest orators, greatest preachers. When he preached, they could hear him for a mile. He said, Oh Lord, give me souls or take my soul. Praying Hyde, the missionary who went to Punjab, he said, Father, give me souls or I die. John Henry Jowett, the great preacher, he, he, something he said, which I'm going to tell you now, you see, it will put into perspective the Romans 9, 1 and 2 and 3. He says, we, we, we can never heal the needs we do not feel. Tearless hearts can never be heralds of the passion. Means, tearless hearts cannot announce the passion. We must pity if we would redeem. We must believe we would be ministers of saving blood. The disciples prayer must be stricken with much crying and many tears. He says prayer has to be, uh, you know, stricken means infected by uh, crying and many tears. The ministers of Calvary must supplicate in blood sweat and their intercession must often touch the point of agony. Where there is no agony, my dear brothers and sisters, prayers fall short. True intercession is sacrifice, a bleeding sacrifice. If we go by what people say, oh, you, you just pray and believe, then Christ did not have to kneel down and sweat bloods, tears of blood, sweat of blood. This is serious stuff, my dear brothers and sisters. It's serious stuff. When I meditated on this, it brought back a reality in my life. It reminded me why I serve God in the first place. <clears throat> For over 30 years, Salvation Army and William Booth were looked down upon. They were persecuted. They suffered just like the today's Christians are suffering. Everywhere they were looked down upon. Finally, once the king recognized Salvation Army, Edward VII invited him to Buckingham Palace to honor him in 1904. He, the king said, you are doing a great work, a great work, General Booth. When King asked him to sign his book, the old man, now 75 years of age, went forward and he wrote this. Mm. Listen to me carefully. Your Majesty, some men's ambition is art. Some men's ambition is fame. Some men's ambition is gold. My ambition is the souls of men. What is your ambition, my dear brothers and sisters? What is your ambition? To live a comfortable life. Our world, this world is not our home. We are just passing through. He says, brethren, in my heart, Paul said, 9-1, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. What is your heart's desire? What is my heart's desire? Let us bow our heads, close our eyes. At this moment when your heads are bowed and closed, let's ask ourselves, where are we in this passion? Maybe there is someone whose hearing is not saved. You are not saved. You need Christ. For the same hell that we are trying to save others is the hell that a non-Christian is heading to. You need him. You need Lord Jesus and Lord Jesus alone. It is easy to lose our first love. The things we loved at the beginning when we came to Christ. Maybe we need to do the first works like what he told uh, the church. Our love for souls and our love and our love for souls may come back. Ask the Lord to give you that. You see, when you look at the life of Paul, when you look at the life of apostles, when you look at the life of prophets, the passion for souls is the highest degree. It is the PhD of his service. That is where you have to reach. Ask him to give it to you. He, spend time with him this week. You don't have to turn on the TV. You don't have to do research. You don't have to do whatever you want to do. Pray and come close to Christ Jesus. It will make a difference. It will make a difference. Even if one or two of you will understand today and get the passion of souls, it is worth my preaching. But I want every one of you to understand that. Understand that you are and mine 
surface prayers will not even go above the building. We need to touch the heart of God with the agony and the pain and the sorrow for our people. There may be someone in your house who is not saved. Maybe your child is not saved. Maybe your parents are not saved. Maybe your brothers and sisters are not saved. What are you doing about it? What are you passionate? Are, is, is your passion for lost souls? Or you have lost the passion? My dear brothers and sisters, it is time, it is time, it is time to look carefully. It is time to consider carefully. Because you see, Christian life, yes, it is a wonderful blessing beyond understanding. Yes, you have been snatched, you and me have been snatched from the jaws of hell. But we don't have to live like somebody who is going to hell. We have to be different. We have to show Christ. It is a great responsibility. It is not enough just to be born again. As long as there is someone you know who has not come to Christ, your agony should not stop. As long as you know. Because once you reach out to people around you, God will bring more people to you. He will display his splendor in your life to the unbelievers. That's what God can do. Do you have the passion or if it is lost? My dear brothers and sisters, it is time to come back to the drawing board to rebuild again, to rebuild again. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. I commit everyone who has heard this message into your hands. Father, we want that passion for souls, the lost passion, the passion where we, our heart beats with your heart, the passion where we agonize, Lord, over souls, Lord Jesus. The Bible says you add it to the church. Father, we pray that you give our church this lost passion, that we, Lord, will, will be people who will be closer to your heart, that our heart will beat like your heart, Lord. You have, what affects your heart will affect us, Lord Jesus. I pray for everyone who has heard this message. Touch their lives. Thank you, Father. I bless them in the name of Jesus. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.